Early in Ayn Rand's last novel, Atlas Shrugged, there's a flashback to the youth of the novel's heroine, Dagny Taggart. Dagny Taggart was nine years old when she decided that she would run the Taggart Transcontinental Railroad someday. She stated it to herself when she stood alone between the rails, looking at the two straight lines of steel that went off into the distance and met in a single point. The two steel lines were brilliant in the sun, and the black ties were like rungs of a ladder which she had to climb. Dagny did not view her career as a job guaranteed by family connections, or as a hassle imposed by a cruel world, but as a ladder which she had to climb, a productive path that would require her best efforts far into the future. She embraced the prospect with solemn pleasure. Rand doubtless drew upon her own experience when creating Dagny's character. In Rand's case, however, the career was that of a writer, not a railroad executive. I decided to be a writer at the age of nine, Rand recalled in later life, and everything I have done was integrated to that purpose. It was an immensely important choice for her, and for the world. It would lead her to flee her native Russia, to master the English language, to become a best-selling novelist with the publication of The Fountainhead, and then Atlas Shrugged, to defy mainstream public opinion on the left and the right, to create a new philosophy called objectivism, and to forge a controversial legacy that's still hotly debated today, many years after her death. Rand's ideas and writings are more popular than ever. Sales of Atlas Shrugged are at an all-time high, and her novels and books are discussed in high schools, coffee shops, university classrooms, the op-ed pages of the nation's newspapers, television news shows, academic meetings of professional philosophers, legal scholars and economists, and even the halls of Congress. In 1999, the United States Postal Service issued an Ayn Rand stamp. How did Rand become such a famous writer? By a passionate dedication to her ideas and to her chosen career. The girl who would later assume the pen name of Ayn Rand was born in Tsarist Russia on February 2, 1905, as Alyssa Rosenbaum. Her father owned a pharmacy shop, and her mother was a homemaker and socialite. Young Alyssa was an intense and bright child who taught herself to read at the age of six. Soon after, she was learning French and devouring detective stories in the children's magazines her mother bought for her. One day, in the pages of a French boys' magazine, the eight-year-old Alyssa found, and fell in love with, her first hero. 1914 was a big turning point in my life anyway. My mother subscribed for me to a boys' magazine, because of the adventure stories. Now, I remember one illustration that impressed me, was a picture of that Englishman you see standing at the wall with a sword or something waiting for someone. But this hero, and his name was Cyrus, was the perfect drawing of my present hero. Tall, long-legged, with kind of, you know, trousers and leggings, uh, the way uh, soldiers wear, but no uh, jacket, just an open colored shirt torn in front, kind of open very low, sleeves rolled at the elbows and hair falling down over one eye. Elements of, of my, at least the appearance of what is my bromide about my type of man, were completely taken from that illustration. The first time that presented in the story is that they're all in a cage, and the cage is being wheeled through this valley to some kind of temple ceremony, and they're all scared except the hero. And I remember the image, the first illustration. He's standing, holding on to the bars of the cage, where everybody else is on the bottom, sitting down or cringing. Uh, thereafter, uh, up to the age of 12, that's the next three years, that was my exclusive love. It was almost mystical in this sense, that I felt it's, I'm totally out of the concerns or the reality of anybody. What they're interested in doesn't matter at all uh, to me, because I know something much higher. 
During a family trip to England, walking down a London street, Alyssa spied a colorful poster showing gaily dressed showgirls in a musical review. Back in her hotel room, she made up stories about those dancers and told them to her younger sisters, who listened raptly. Suddenly a thought struck her. This is what writers do. All the time. And she knew her course was set for life. She wanted to create stories about people and events she could admire and look up to. In later life, she wrote that the best of mankind's youth start out with this kind of attitude toward their lives, describing it as, for most, a sense of enormous expectation, the sense that one's life is important, that great achievements are within one's capacity, and that great things lie ahead. With her choice to become a writer now made, fiction writing occupied more and more of Alyssa's time and energy. At school, she wrote short novels during classes she thought boring. These early efforts lacked plot, but featured interesting individuals doing unusual things. They were precursors of the fictional heroes she would create in later life. Soon, Alyssa discovered the novels of Victor Hugo, and her world widened to encompass the vast dramatic tapestries he wove in such masterpieces as Les Miserables and 93. Along with such romantic geniuses as Edmund Rostand, author of Cyrano de Bergerac, Hugo extended a spiritual lifeline to the teenaged Alyssa, expanding her vision of how much was possible to a novelist. Alyssa's artistic awareness continued to expand. She was captivated by French and Viennese operettas, and she fell in love with cinema, still in its silent infancy. All of these art forms spoke to her of the possibility that she could make a life's work out of putting down and writing her blinding picture of people as they could be. But as she grew to adulthood, Alyssa became increasingly aware that she had been born into a country whose culture and political system held in contempt the ideals of individualism she cherished. When Alyssa was 12 years old, she heard the opening gunshots of the Russian Revolution from her apartment window in St. Petersburg. The idea shaping this revolution was that the individual must live for others, for the state, and sacrifice personal happiness for the good of the collective. Soon, Russia descended into a communist dictatorship. This was the beginning of 20th century totalitarianism which eventually killed millions and millions of people in Russia, Germany, China, and elsewhere. But long before the perpetration of these atrocities, Alyssa was morally outraged by the very idea of collectivism, by collectivism's denunciation of the individual. She saw its essence as an attack on the most intelligent, able, and heroic among men. And to attack the heroic was to attack Alyssa personally. Uh, then the Russian Revolution was uh, February 1917. Then the Communist Revolution was the so-called October Revolution. And that was in, the, in that same year, October 17. Uh, we left in the fall of 1918. By that time, there was a civil war going on in the uh, south and the Ukraine. And there were so-called White Russian armies 
um, we wanted uh, to get out uh, to escape communism simply and uh, father got a permit to travel on the ground that uh, my sister who had had pneumonia twice needed to go to the Crimea so that's how we managed to get out of Petrograd now that was in the fall of 1918 and we came back in 1921 by 21 uh, the civil war was over and the whole Russia was communist. I began to suddenly found myself in effect, uh, asking a lot of whys in an abstract manner, but begin to define the reasons for what I believe. And then I realized that what I was now doing is, uh, is thinking in principle. Today I would say it was the process of integration really, but that I wouldn't have known then. I think it, uh, it may not be irrelevant that, that that was the year of the start of the revolution. The first, the springboard for it was the fact that I was very much in sympathy with the February revolution. Uh, because, you know, it was the bloodless revolution where everybody was for freedom and the whole atmosphere. So, though it was in a kind of a sentimental Russian way, nevertheless, it was all the glorification of freedom. In my terms, it was the individual. But today I would call the rights of the, of the individual. Why the individual's right? Why is it right for him to be free? Why is the strong, independent man important? By what right can anybody tell a man what he should do or what he should live for? And of course, then when the October Revolution happened, that's uh, when my first uh, conviction began of a kind which I remember specifically concluding, the one that I mentioned in the preface to the delivery, that uh, uh, nobody has the right to tell men to exist for the sake of the state. The, the evil, which before that I would have called collectivism, although I wouldn't know the word, it would be the group, the herd, that kind of, of entity, now began to be statist, conscious. In contrast to the increasingly bleak prospect of life in Russia, Alyssa's high school studies included an introduction to the United States of America, the world's foremost society of individualism. From the earliest age, I had the impression, even before the revolution, that culture, civilization, anything which is interesting, as I would have put to me, is abroad. Now, uh, I, in a general sort of sense, thought that I would probably be a, a writer in Russian. Therefore, I don't think I thought of settling abroad. But what it amounted to would be that I would probably live abroad, as many Russians in those days did. Uh, that in one way or another, what I would have considered my home would have been European culture. I didn't begin to even discover America till about the last years uh, of high school. Uh, for the first time, incidentally, it was only in the last year of high school that they gave us a small course in American <laughs> history. Before that, in all history courses, they gave you only Europe, Russian history, of course, and European. And it's in this particular high school in the South, when I graduated, they had one course on America. And uh, to me, it was almost in incredible. Before that, America was mentioned in geography books, but not as history. I didn't really know about the Declaration of Independence or what the American system is until the last year. And I'm not sure that I even would have grasped it all correctly. I would not have had a clear idea of capitalism or collectivism. All I knew is that that's the country of individualism. In college, Alyssa majored in history to gain knowledge for her future writing and philosophy to help shape her value system. But as communists took over the University of Petrograd, her outspoken hostility to their ideas left her in fear for herself and her family. The situation we are living is uh, practically biographical, uh, autobiographical in the sense of background. I was taking chronologically the exact events as they were happening at that time. Uh, in the first year, when I first went to college, uh, students were quite outspoken and I attended my first student meeting, just as I described it with the living, and almost fell in love with one of the young man who was a conservative and was making violent anti-Soviet speeches. And I felt very romantically impressed with him for a single value. He was enormously, arrogantly, 
outspoken against the communists. In the first meeting that I attended, they were making this speech. He was making this speech, that, uh, which I quoted him with the evening. Uh, that was an authentic one. That uh, Russian students had always been uh, in the vanguard of any fight against tyranny, no matter of what color. And statements like that, there were quite a few communists in, in among the students. There was an official communist cell in the university, and the uh, people who belonged to it wore certain kind of red badges. And they were very much despised by uh, the majority of the students. They were practically ostracized in a quietly hostile way, so that the atmosphere was quite free just that first year. And I made quite a few very uh, daring statements at those meetings. I wouldn't be allowed to make speeches yet. See, the freshman, the first year, was not allowed. We were uh, allowed to vote. This was elections for student council. But you weren't allowed to make speeches or do anything until the second year. Uh, by allowed, I don't mean by law, but simply by student conventions. And uh, but I started arguments with communists, and I remember uh, one day telling one of them that they were all be hung from street lanterns someday from lampposts, and then went home terrified. And that night I really was afraid, because I realized that I had put my whole family in danger. By the end of that first year, there was a purge of students. They began to tighten. And that same young man, plus a lot of others, and girls who had gone out with them, but who weren't political in any sense, were all sent to Siberia. By the second year, there were no more political speeches. Meanwhile, movies provided Alyssa precious glimpses of life in the West. Films by favorite directors such as Cecil B. DeMille and Fritz Lang provided her with a very specific and inspiring view of life abroad. Uh, my last year in universities, more theaters were opening, smaller ones. And I began to uh, be able to go and see a few on the certain fourth run houses, in effect. And that fascinated me, particularly because uh, that was a much more specific, not merely symbolic view of life abroad. Uh, that was uh, the reason why for my last year in Russia and getting ready or hoping to come to America, I decided to go to that movie school to learn the technique of movies and production generally. And the great advantage of going to that school was that they gave you free passes to all movie theaters, since they were all state. And then I began to see movies every night, right? And that was the most wonderful period. So that those movie stars and movie magazines from abroad, they came, well, the, the world from Mars. And I remember there were some American movies where you could see New York, just shots, usually long shots, and I would see through two shows just to catch it because it would be very brief. They never had one that showed much, but you could get that glimpse once in a while. I can't tell you how glamorous it was at, at that distance. Well, it still is. On graduation, she enrolled in film school and thought about becoming a Soviet screenwriter, incorporating her individualistic ideas into her scripts. She even went so far as to present a fellow film student, a loyal communist, with a writing sample along those lines. But the student could tell there was something odd about the story and its theme, and Alyssa soon concluded that she had no future in Soviet cinema. So uh, after I graduated from school is when I got the job as a guide uh, through a museum. And the museum was the Peter Paul Fortress in Petrograd, where I had to lecture on the history of the place for excursions. And I held that job until I left for America. Now it's about that period after graduation that we received letters from some relatives of mothers, who, uh, her first cousins, who had left before the revolution. 
long before I was born, actually. Uh, mother had met them as a child, but I wouldn't have known them at all. And they were writing to inquire how we were and what was happening to us. Uh, and mother began a correspondence, and that is uh, when uh, I and mother both had the idea that perhaps they could help me to go abroad. Because I was speaking of going abroad in one way or another. I was desperately anxious to go. So we wrote to this relatives uh, that I would like to come as a visitor. And they sent me the affidavit, the papers necessary. And my main interest was getting ready for this trip and studying English, which I didn't know at all. And I left for America then in January 1926. On January 17, 1926, with the help of her family, 20-year-old Alyssa Rosenbaum embarked alone on her journey to America. She would never return to Russia. Many years later, when she became politically active and started giving speeches to American audiences, hecklers sometimes greeted her thick Russian accent with jeers, asking what right did a foreigner have to talk about America? I chose to be an American, she would respond defiantly. What did you do besides having been born? Fearful that her family, still trapped in Russia, would be punished for her intransigent anti-communism, Alyssa adopted the pseudonym Ayn Rand for her new Writer's Life in America. She traveled by boat to New York City, then by train to Chicago for a six-month stay with relatives, and finally by train to Hollywood, California. At the studio of famed director Cecil B. DeMille, one of Rand's idols, she applied for a job but was told there were no openings. Then, on her way out the front gate, it was as if she had suddenly stepped into the pages of an exciting Ayn Rand story. I arrived in New York. I stayed in New York only a couple of days with some friends of my relatives who, whom they had asked to meet me and then proceeded to Chicago. Stayed there for six months with my relatives and then went on, uh, on to Hollywood on my own. I borrowed money from the relatives, $100. I felt that I had to sell something or make a name for myself as fast as possible. I was here on a six-month permit because I couldn't yet hope to write in a literary English. But I had figured out that since this was the day of the silent movies, I could write, even if it's slightly broken English, enough to uh, write an outline, the scenario, just the original of a story, and then they could somebody else could write the titles. And uh, one of my relatives, one of mother's cousins, uh, owned a movie theater in Chicago, a small neighborhood theater. So she gave me, through a distributor, a letter of introduction from, one, from the distributor in Chicago to the DeMille studio. DeMille at that time had an independent studio of his own in Culver City. Uh, what he was famous for is society, glamour, sex, and adventure, and I liked almost all of the ones that I had seen in Russia. So he was my particular idol of the American screen. When I arrived at this studio and I went to the publicity department and presented that letter and I told him what I was interested in as a junior screenwriter's job, if it was possible. Now I walk out of that st uh, studio and you know, it's the colonial kind of mansion in Culver City, which was Pate la later. And it has a, a driveway in front of the main building that goes to a gate. And as I start walk down the driveway, I see an open roadster park and a man at the wheel talking to somebody outside the car, and it was the mill. And it was too long before he started driving. He drives up to the gate, stops, looks at me and, said, and asks, why are you looking at me? So I told him I had just come from Russia, and I'm very happy to, to see him. So he opens the door of the car and says, get in. I didn't know where we were going. I got in, and he started driving. Now, isn't that a fantastic story?
As a junior screenwriter for DeMille, Rand was able to compose scenarios for the silent screen using her limited English skills. On her own time, she wrote short stories that she knew were not publishable. I did not attempt to write professionally, she later recalled, until I knew what I was doing and felt that I was ready. Her early stories told of unrequited love and desperate love, of witty crooks and perky news reporters, of famous actresses and Russian convicts. There were stories with sad endings, happy endings, and surprise endings, stories that prepared Rand for the next phase of her career as a novelist. During these early years, Rand met and dated the man who was to become her husband. I knew what values of character I wanted to find in a man, she said later. I met such a man. His name is Frank O'Connor. Their first encounter was on the set of DeMille's movie King of Kings, but then they lost touch. Now, what was happening on my career was that when uh, the King of Kings was over, the mill offered me the job as a junior writer. Now, he really was wonderful. First story he gave me was a story entitled My Dog. And uh, then another story was called The Skyscraper, because it was an original he had bought. And uh, it, uh, it involved the rivalry of two rough and tough construction workers who were in love with the same girl. And he told me that he didn't like the story very much, uh, but um, he liked the idea of a story about the construction of a skyscraper. But it's because of that story that I found Frank again. There was a construction job going on right in Hollywood. Uh, on a, the, the, you know what is now the Broadway department store there on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard? And I made an appointment with the superintendent through somebody at the studio uh, to come to interview him and, and uh, watch the construction. I got there. He had left a message that he had been detained somewhere and uh, could I please come an hour later? I didn't want to go back home so uh, I decided I'll wait in the public library, which just blocked from there. And I entered the public library, and the first thing I see is Frank sitting there in deep. And the thrilling thing was that I stopped there, and he looked up. I was some distance away. And the way he smiled, and he recognized me immediately. And almost implicit in it, I kind of sensed he hadn't forgotten me. So he got up, and since you couldn't talk there, he said, let's go out. And we walked around blocks, and we talked. And this time, I remember, we talked about movie originals and what he wanted to do. He had some ideas for originals. They were all outrageous comedies. Uh, I mean, outrageous in the sense, almost blasphemous. Uh, some on religious subjects or something like that. So right then, he invited me to dinner. And from then on, we were going steady. Ayn Rand and Frank O'Connor married in 1929. He is the first person to hear everything I write, Rand once said. And his criticism has always been correct and valuable. His viewpoint is the same as mine, but he has always been objective about my work. When I start to write a book, the characters become members of our family. The young couple struggled economically. In 1927, Rand left the DeMille studio and scrambled to find work. Now, after, I had to do something. And uh, this was the depression approaching. So that there was very, very difficult to find anything. 
And the only things that were available were waitresses' jobs. And so I tried that, and I didn't even know the names of the food. So the first restaurant, I was fired the same day. The last one, I lasted the whole week. And then I did uh, envelope stuffing and tried to sell subscriptions to the Hollywood Citizen. I hated those jobs. I hated that whole period. I regarded it like Rourke in the quarry, only much worse because Rourke would at least be much more conscious of what he was doing and do it intentionally. I felt that this was despair and horror. It's at that time that a friend of ours, who was a, you, uh, you know, a Russian actor, um, he got me a job in the RKO wardrobe. A friend of his had just got the job of art director in charge of all those departments. And that's the only job where they could use someone who couldn't type or take shorthand. And I got this job at $20 a week. Within six months, I got $25. I got a raise without having asked for it. And a year later, I was the head of that department. And I really did very well, loathing and hating it. I also uh, wrote two screen originals, both of them made in Russia, and I sold one of them, which was Red Phone, to Universal Pictures. And along with the sale, I went uh, a six weeks job to write the first adaptation of it in screen form, because the original was just eight page synopsis. Uh, now, on the proceeds of Red Phone, I wrote Night of January 16th, MGM took an option on uh, Night of January 16th, it was, was called Penthouse Legend. I wrote it as a stage play, and I had an agent in Hollywood who had a representative in New York. In the meantime, MGM became interested and took one of the producers there, and they took an option on it. And I went to MGM to write a screen adaptation, which I had a miserable time with. And I wrote the screenplay, but they didn't like it, apparently, they didn't pick up the option. But that gave us some more money. Then I finished uh, with the living and sent it off to New York. And I had a terrible time with it because I began waiting for letters from the agent. I had asked her to report to me what happens, and there'll be one rejection after another. Uh, the main income by that time was Frank's or his work in pictures. I mean, I think by the time we landed in New York, we had $50 between us. Uh, Frank's brother was here, and so we had someone at least to borrow from a little, but uh, not much because he didn't have much himself. That's when we lived in a furnished room, and that was as near as we came to real starvation. It was much worse than Hollywood. It was already after 1929 and, and the Depression, you see. So uh, the only thing I got was being a leader, not for Paramount, which came later, but for RKO first and then MGM. And I was doing outside reading. We lived, I remember our budget was approximately $11 a week, which is all I could count on. Uh, the, the, my one advantage was I could read several languages, French, German, and Russian. I could read German enough to make a synopsis, and so they were giving me most of the foreign stuff. They even had some Soviet-Russian plays synopsized. Rand's play, Night of January 16th, dramatized a murder trial whose jury is selected from the audience at each performance. She tried to evenly balance the evidence for guilt or innocence so that the jury's verdict would depend on the jurors' basic attitudes. Those who valued independence would be inclined to vote for acquittal, while those who valued conformity would be inclined to convict. Rand wrote a different ending for either possible verdict. The play opened in California during the spring of 1935 as Woman on Trial, and eventually it moved on to Broadway. Although Rand never wrote an autobiography, her first published novel, We the Living, was what she termed an intellectual autobiography capturing the feeling of being trapped in Soviet Russia. 
The novel tells the story of a young woman named Kira, who yearns to become an engineer, and her love for Leo, whose contempt for the communist state matches her own. Of her heroine, Rand said, the specific events of Kira's life were not mine. Her ideas, her convictions, her values were and are. The theme of We the Living, in Rand's words, is the supreme value of a human life and the evil of a totalitarian state that claims the right to sacrifice. The intellectual climate of America in the 1930s, the so-called Red Decade, made an anti-Soviet story a tough sell. However, Macmillan and company finally published the book in 1936. Word of mouth gradually boosted sales, but once the initial run of 3,000 copies was exhausted, Macmillan breached its contractual obligation for a second printing. Anticipating only modest sales, Macmillan had destroyed the metal type after the first run, which in that pre-digital era would require the expense of typesetting from scratch. We the Living remained out of print until 1959, when the success of Atlas Shrugged awakened publishers' interest in her previous writing. Although We the Living was not a bestseller, Rand was now a published novelist, and she used that status to make contact with individualists she admired at the time. To H. L. Mencken, she wrote, I fully realize that I am a green, very helpless beginner who has the arrogance of embarking single-handed against what many call the irrevocable trend of our century. Her repudiation of collectivism was to take a radically different form in a novelette called Anthem. In 1937, Ein and Frank were spending a summer in Connecticut while Frank appeared in a stock version of Night of January 16th at the Stony Creek Theater. In an intense struggle to work on her next novel, The Fountainhead, Ein used the solitude of the country to write. Literally tearing her hair out over the plot, she took a break to complete a novelette called Anthem. Originally a play she conceived in Russia, Anthem was a futuristic account of a world where individualism had been obliterated and the word I had been replaced with the word we. It was her hymn to man's ego, to man's absolute self, and an account of what she believed were the true implications of all forms of collectivism. Written in the form of a diary, the story culminates with the protagonist rediscovering the concept of individualism. At first, man was enslaved by the gods, but he broke their chains. Then he was enslaved by the kings, but he broke their chains. He was enslaved by his birth, by his kin, by his race. but he broke their chains. He declared to all his brothers that a man has rights which neither God nor king nor other men can take away from him, no matter what their number. For his is the right of man, and there is no right on earth above this right. As the 1930s came to a close, Rand had earned significant sums as a writer, but it would be several years later when she sold the movie rights to her first bestseller, The Fountainhead, that she finally achieved financial independence. From the time she fell in love with Cyrus Paltons, the dashing adventurer in the mysterious valley, Rand had been a hero worshipper. She had sought to create in her fiction a vision of the world as it could be, if people chose to live up to the best within themselves. 
For many years, however, she explained, I was not ready to attempt the portrait of an ideal man. His first appearance in my writing is Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead. What did she mean by an ideal man? Her full answer to that question is contained in her novels. At the end of 1935, Rand began working on The Fountainhead, originally titled Secondhand Lives. In her early notes on the story, she wrote, The first purpose of the book is a defense of egoism in its real meaning. The first idea for the poem came while I was still on Willie Living. I don't remember the exact date. Specifically, is the birth of the Fountainhead as such. And this was uh, the question in my mind about the difference between me and one girl I knew in Hollywood in pictures. It was a girl whom we met. She happened to live in the same apartment building and she worked at RTO. She seemed to be enormously ambitious. She was definitely a Hollywood climber. And a, a question I asked her is, can she tell me what is her goal in life? She said, if nobody had an automobile, I would not want one. If some people have two automobiles, I want two automobiles. It was literally like one of those light bulbs going off in my mind, like a dramatic revelation that I saw immediately the principal the difference between me and this girl. And that was Rourke and Kitty. It was in the fall of 1935, uh, after January 16 had opened, uh, that I made my first notes for the novel. And I remember the date because my first notes are, I still have and the date is marked on them. And uh, then, of course, one of the first things I did was to read Frank Lloyd Wright biography. There were very few books except Frank Lloyd Wright biography on the careers of architects, practically none. And then, while I was studying architecture generally, uh, which was one line of work, the plot line consisted of now working out the theme in action. And uh, it was really worked out theoretically. For instance, the characters of Wynand and Tui were the next step. The procedure of my thought was uh, that if we take the ideal man as the center, that is really the theme, of the story, that's Rourke, then in relation to him, I show three other types in this way. That Rourke is the man who could be the ideal man and was. Wynand is the man who wasn't but could have been. Kitty was the man who wasn't and didn't know it. Tui is the man who was not the ideal man and knew it. So that, that was the definition for myself as to why I take these four as the key figures. She chose architecture as the backdrop for her story because it is a field of work that covers both art and a basic need of men's survival, and because one cannot find a more eloquent symbol of man as creator than a man who is a builder. The hero is Howard Rourke, an innovative architect who defied convention to build structures whose form followed their function and whose designs were uniquely his creation. As Rand once put it, the theme of the Fountainhead is individualism and collectivism, not in politics, but in man's soul. She wrote the first third of the novel before submitting chapters to publishers. Twelve publishers turned her down before the Bob's Merrill Company said yes in December 1941, on condition that she deliver the completed manuscript by December 31, 1942. It was a year of intense creative effort, during which Rand once wrote longhand for 30 hours without sleep. She typed the manuscript herself, and it was ready on time.
The reviews were generally superficial, and so Rand was extremely grateful that the New York Times reviewer, Lorraine Pruitt, seemed to understand the book. Pruitt wrote that Rand has written a hymn in praise of the individual, and you will not be able to read this masterful book without thinking through some of the basic concepts of our times. Years later, Rand said that this review saved her outlook on the world at the time. After a slow start, the book reached the bestseller list, selling 100,000 copies in 1945. There would be no repeat of the Macmillan debacle from 10 years earlier. Enough books were printed to meet the demand. With publishing success came bidding from Hollywood Studios for the movie rights. Here is Rand's description of the negotiation with Warner Brothers. This telephone call came and said that they were interested in the movie rights of Fountainhead. Uh, and they want to know what price we will take. I said 50000 So he said, I want to warn you that you are running the risk of losing the sale. I said, I'll take that chance. And then there was a delay of, I think, a week or, or ten days. In the meantime, I have an appointment with some businessmen to meet him for lunch to discuss uh, my idea of the conservative campaign for the book. I come back home. And the moment I open the door, Frank is standing somewhere in the middle of the living room, and I knew something had happened. There was an abnormal look on his face, a benevolent. He said, well, darling, uh, you've earned $50,000 while you were out to lunch, meaning that Warner Brothers had accepted it. Uh, and they made only one condition, uh, that I come to Hollywood to adapt it. They'll pay the transportation, and that I give them four weeks free, included in the price. What I remember, the immediate uh, day after, his telephone call. Uh, Frank and I go out to eat dinner, and usually, you see, if I uh, was busy in the afternoon, I had no time to cook, we ate in a little cafeteria. It was a pretty bad place to eat, but very convenient when we uh, couldn't cook. So we go there to dinner, and we both had the same experience. We always, you know, selected fr uh, food by the right hand side of the menu by the price. And I think there were two types of dinner, 65 cents and 45. We always ate the 45 dinner. And we come there both, we would afterwards compare notes, we start looking at the 45 cent dinner and suddenly remember we can have the 65. <laughs> this made the most, uh, uh, the, the issue of wealth, uh, that made it realer than anything else. That fact that we suddenly could all order a 65 cent dinner if we wanted to. Along with her newfound financial independence, Rand had attained the public prominence of a best-selling author. Among other things, this meant she received a large volume of fan mail. She especially enjoyed letters from those in the military. What I liked most was that of any predominant group uh, of uh, the population, the majority of the letters, and all of them good, were from men in the armed services. This was during the war. And I remember letters 
from flyers, for instance, saying that after every mission they would gather it around a candle and read passages from the fountainhead. And others, uh, an awful lot from young aviators, another letter that said he would have felt much better if he thought that what this war is fought for is for the ideals of the fountainhead and all those letters coming from overseas. I answered as many as I could of those. Uh, they were the best. Amid the post-war debate over communism's threat to American ideals, Rand made her first forays into political non-fiction writing. She became involved with the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, a conservative group formed by Louis B. Mayer and including such Hollywood heavyweights as Walt Disney, Hedda Hopper, Gary Cooper, and John Wayne. This led to her pamphlet, Screen Guide for Americans, which offered techniques for filmmakers to voluntarily monitor communist propaganda in their movies. Rand also wrote The Individualist Credo, published in Reader's Digest as The Only Path to Tomorrow, and began making notes on a longer work, The Moral Basis of Individualism. In 1947, the House on American Activities Committee invited the Screen Guide author to testify on communist propaganda in the movies. She agreed on the condition that her testimony not be censored. Rand analyzed a movie called Song of Russia, an absurdly inaccurate glamorization of Russia which she felt did not even deserve scrutiny. However, she wanted to set the record straight about life in the Soviet Union. Don't they do things at all like Americans? Don't they walk across town to visit their mother-in-law or somebody? Look, it's very hard to explain. It's almost impossible to convey to a free people what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. I can tell you a lot of details. I can never completely convince you because you are free. And it's in a way good that you don't it can't even conceive of what it's like. Certainly they have friends and mother-in-laws. <laughs> they try to live a human life, but you understand that it is totally inhuman. Now try to imagine what it's like if you are in constant terror from morning to night and at night you're waiting for a doorbell to ring. If you are afraid of everything and everybody. If you live in a country where human life is nothing, less than nothing, and you know it. You don't know who, when is going to do what to you because he may have friends somewhere. Where there is no law and no rights of any kind. In late 1943, she and her husband had settled into a bold modern house designed by Richard Neutra and located on 13 acres in Chatsworth, California. Through the end of the decade, Rand worked as a Hollywood screenwriter, not only on The Fountainhead, but on such films as Love Letters, starring Jennifer Jones and Joseph Cotton, and You Came Along, starring Elizabeth Scott and Bob Cummings. If she had stopped with The Fountainhead, Rand would have earned recognition as a major literary figure. But she was about to embark on a much more ambitious project, one that would involve broader themes than individualism versus collectivism. This new project would lead her to develop a new philosophy that she would later call objectivism. The Fountainhead, she said, was only an overture to Atlas Shrugged. In Atlas Shrugged, the adventurous hero worship, intellectual drive, and emotional heat that characterized Rand's previous novels rose to new levels of intensity. It is difficult to summarize the story without giving away its plot, but the book's original advertising copy deftly hints at what awaits the reader. <laughs> 
This novel, Rand's magnum opus, required 13 years to write. Atlas was the one central integrating purpose of everything I did. The first step was to project in a generalized way kind of the philosophical progression of what would be needed, what kind of men or characters would be needed to carry a story of that kind. The gold and Dagen were the two set almost immediately. That was always the type that I intended to present someday as my ideal woman, or as the feminine Rourke, in effect, to do in my metaphysics what Rourke did. And uh, for this type of story, a woman engineer would be just ideal. The hardest and most important task of a novelist, she once wrote, is to integrate his plot structure to the theme of his novel. In the case of Atlas, the theme was quite broad, the role of the mind in man's existence, and the plot quite complex, involving the mysterious decline of Western civilization, and the writing took longer than Rand predicted. In particular, she underestimated the time it would take to complete the speech in which the hero reveals what is destroying the world and what's needed to save it. She thought three months would be enough, but it ended up taking her two years. During these years of hard mental labor, Rand took pleasure in the company of a small group of individuals who gathered socially to discuss current issues and read the novel in progress. Well, there was a group of us around 10 or 12 who were related either one was a friend of another or a relative of another. And as a joke, Ayn started to call us the collective. As a joke, because we were supposed to be all arch individualists, we came to uh, her place on a regular basis, starting originally on Saturday nights to read the manuscript of Atlas Shrugged. And then we would read whatever was available or some given chapter, and then there would be an all-around discussion monitored by her, and then she would serve something around midnight or one in the morning. Sometimes we would stay till three or four in the morning. And at first we got to know her best through these weekly Saturday night sessions. In order to fully define an ideal man in fiction, Rand found that she had to originate a philosophy worthy of him. Do you consider yourself primarily a novelist or primarily a philosopher? I would say I'm primarily both equally and for the same reasons. You see, my main interest and purpose, both in literature and in philosophy, is to define and present the image of an ideal man the specific concrete image of what man can be and ought to be. And when I started writing, when I approached the task of literature and began to study philosophy, I discovered that I was in profound disagreement with all the existing philosophies, particularly their codes of morality. Therefore, I had to do my own thinking. I had to define my own full philosophical system in order to discover and present the kind of ideas and premises that make an ideal man possible in order to define what kind of convictions would result in the character of an ideal man. As Rand wrote the final chapters, publishers eagerly sought to bid on the first novel in more than a decade by the author of The Fountainhead. One publisher, Random House, won Rand's favor with an unusual proposal. And I explained to Random House boys just what my problem was. I stated open. And it's then that Bennett Cerf came up with a brilliant idea, a philosophical contest. He said, why don't we select four or five publishers whom we are most interested in and submit the book simultaneously. And it wouldn't be an issue of bidding for conditions. Then I would ask the publishers to read it and to tell me what their attitude would be philosophically and uh, ideologically. I was very startled by Donald Klopper's philosophical uh, acuteness when he asked me the following question. 
He said, but if this is an uncompromising defense of capitalism, wouldn't you have to clash with the Judeo-Christian tradition of ethics? And that was the second time that got them the book. Atlas Shrugged was published on October 10, 1957. Atlas Shrugged would rank among the top ten on the New York Times bestseller list. Rand was gravely disappointed in the culture's response to Atlas Shrugged. She had no illusions that her radical philosophy would sweep the world in her lifetime, but she did hope to find defenders among mature, established intellectuals. Such individuals, however, did not step forward. In 1958, Rand's student, psychologist Nathaniel Brandon, began giving public lectures in New York City on her philosophy, which she now called objectivism. Rand herself emerged as a public figure, speaking to college and university audiences, appearing on radio and television, and giving print interviews in Playboy and many other publications. She was intent upon explaining her ideas and getting Atlas Shrugged a wider readership. But however much the attacks in the press hurt her, they only stoked the fire that would bring her out into the public. She did not like public speaking. She did not regard herself as a teacher by profession or by interest. She thought her accent was wrong as far as public speaking, and she'd never been able to do much with her accent. But she would be damned if she was going to let Atlas Shrugged be commented on exclusively by the critics who hated it. She got invitations, so she made up her mind that despite all her reservations, she was going to speak at least enough to give it some publicity. So she went reluctantly. Uh, she faced at first very antagonistic audiences. They booed her. They tried to out yell her, but of course she was immutable. Rand's first major essay, For the New Intellectual, argued that the course of Western civilization was and is determined by its dominant philosophical ideas. Rand called for a new kind of intellectual, one who championed reason, rational self-interest, individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism. Much of her subsequent writing was aimed at formulating, explaining, and showcasing the philosophical principles that these new intellectuals would need to understand and advocate. Based on the success of Brandon's initial lectures, Rand authorized the Nathaniel Brandon Institute to offer a variety of courses applying her philosophy, taught by lecturers Rand approved. NBI remained in business until 1968 offering both live lectures and audio recordings that were replayed in local venues around the world. During the years 1962 to 1976, Rand edited three successive periodicals, The Objectivist Newsletter, The Objectivist, and The Ayn Rand Letter. Ultimately, Rand the essayist generated dozens of original articles, enough to launch a series of books on philosophy and its major branches, plus collections of cultural commentary. Through her nonfiction, Rand articulated and explained basic principles and applications of the philosophy she formally called objectivism, but informally called a philosophy for living on earth.
The death of Frank O'Connor in November 1979, not long after the couple celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, was a terrible blow to Rand. But by 1981, inspired by an actor she admired, she was writing her own teleplay for an Atlas Shrugged miniseries. It was her first fiction writing in more than 20 years, but she was unable to complete it. Having written only one-third of the script, Rand became ill after a speaking engagement in New Orleans. She died of heart failure at her New York apartment on March 6, 1982, at the age of 77. Rand utterly rejected the widespread view that philosophy is a parlor game for ivory tower academics and that fiction is an escape from reality. Philosophy, she held, is a practical guide to living and fiction a way of imaginatively projecting the real possibilities life holds for every individual. Like her fictional heroes, Rand regarded the pursuit of a central productive purpose as essential to a happy life. For Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead, that central purpose was creating new buildings. For Dagny Taggart in Atlas Shrugged, it was running a transcontinental railroad. And for Ayn Rand, that central purpose was writing. About fictional heroes. About philosophical ideas. About real life and how to live it. My life has been single-tracked, she wrote. A life consciously devoted to a conscious purpose. And at the conclusion, I would say it's a very benevolent universe, and I love it, and any struggle was worth it and how. And I don't regret a minute of it. What I mean is that the struggle or the unhappiness is enormously unimportant. Uh, but the positive is wonderful. And uh, if it's the last interview on my life, so I, w I hope I will, and know I will be saying it at 80. It's a benevolent universe. Ayn Rand was many things. Philosopher, novelist, essayist, cultural commentator, public intellectual. But she was essentially one thing. A writer. In the end, Rand died in the happy certainty that she had achieved her basic goal in life. That the fictional heroes she created, Howard Rourke, Hank Reardon, and the rest, fully embodied the burning passion to live that she felt as a little girl, and that she was able to paint in words her blinding picture of people as they could be.